a country smaller than New Jersey, travel times measured in minutes, not hours. Yet billions are being poured into high-speed rail infrastructure that some call unnecessary, others call inevitable. Israel is betting its economic future on steel tracks and electric trains, while critics question whether the math actually works. Israel is building one of the most ambitious high-speed rail networks relative to its size anywhere on Earth. The goal seems simple. Connect Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in 28 minutes, link major cities at speeds exceeding 250 kilometers per hour, and pull millions of cars off congested highways. But beneath the surface, this project exposes critical questions about infrastructure spending, geographic constraints, and whether a country this small even needs trains this fast. The numbers don't tell the whole story. And hub worries. Neither do the politicians promising transformation. If you enjoy massive engineering projects and future technology, subscribe to Next Blueprint, like the video, and comment where you think this is heading. Israel's existing rail network isn't slow by accident. It's slow by design. Decades of underinvestment, outdated signaling systems, and tracks built for freight rather than passengers created a transport system that couldn't compete with highways. The Tel Aviv to Jerusalem route, one of the busiest corridors in the country, took 90 minutes by train. Drivers could make it in 50. The calculus was obvious. Railways lost. Then in 2018, the first high-speed line opened. The Jerusalem-Tel Aviv route dropped to 32 minutes. Ridership exploded. Suddenly, rail wasn't the slower option anymore. It was the obvious choice. Exceeding, commuters who spent hours stuck in traffic could now work on their laptops while traveling at 160 kilometers per hour through tunnels carved beneath the Judean hills. The shift wasn't gradual, it was immediate. But this created a new problem. Success proved there was demand, and demand revealed how inadequate the rest of the network actually was. Cities like Haifa, Beersheba, and Eilat remained disconnected from the high-speed vision. The network worked as a single line. It didn't work as a system. Engineers knew expansion was inevitable. They also knew it wouldn't be simple. Israel sits on a narrow strip of land with extreme elevation changes, fragile ecosystems, and underground complexities that complicate every major project. High-speed rail requires flat, straight tracks. Israel offers mountains, valleys, and desert terrain that shifts unpredictably. The solution involves tunneling through rock formations, building elevated viaducts across valleys, and reinforcing foundations in areas prone to seismic activity. These aren't minor adjustments. They're fundamental redesigns. The Carmel Tunnels near Haifa took over a decade to complete. Similar challenges await every proposed high-speed route. The planned northern extension toward the Lebanese border requires boring through limestone and navigating underground water systems that could destabilize tunnel walls. Engineers raised concerns about construction timelines stretching far beyond initial projections. Geological surveys revealed layers of soft chalk beneath harder rock, creating variable support conditions that increase costs and slow progress. Then there's the desert. Extending high-speed rail south toward Oilat means laying track through the Negev where summer temperatures exceed 45 degrees Celsius. Rails expand in heat. Expansion causes warping. Warping at high speeds causes derailments. The solution involves continuous welded rail with specialized expansion joints and temperature monitoring systems. But even with precautions, desert operations introduce maintenance demands that urban lines don't face. Sand infiltration damages moving parts. Heat stress shortens component lifespans. Some experts believe the ALOT extension will cost three times more per kilometer than northern routes. Official estimates put the full high-speed rail network at 150 billion shekels, roughly $40 billion. Independent analysts suggest the real number could reach 60 billion. The gap between projections and reality matters because it determines whether the project remains economically viable or becomes a decades-long financial burden. Every cost overrun delays other infrastructure priorities. Every miscalculation compounds. Here's the hidden limitation. High-speed rail only generates revenue when trains run at capacity. Empty seats mean losses. Israel's population is growing, but growth alone doesn't guarantee ridership. Ticket prices must remain competitive with cars and buses. If prices rise to cover costs, passengers disappear. If prices stay low to maintain ridership, the system operates at a deficit. 
The break-even point exists somewhere in between, and finding it requires predicting travel behavior 20 years into the future. Critics argue the government is overestimating demand and underestimating maintenance costs. A train traveling at 250 km per hour experiences exponentially more wear than one traveling at 120. Brake systems degrade faster. Wheels require more frequent replacement. Track inspections must happen more often. These costs accumulate. Over a 30-year lifespan, maintenance could exceed initial construction budgets. Yet public projections rarely include full life cycle expenses. If this surprised you, hit like. Infrastructure in Israel isn't just about engineering. It's about identity, settlement, and strategic priorities. Every proposed rail line connects not just cities, but communities with different political alignments. Extending high-speed service to settlements in the West Bank remains controversial. Some view it as economic development. Others see it as cementing territorial claims through infrastructure. The debate isn't technical, it's existential. Route planning reveals these tensions. The proposed Eastern Corridor would bring high-speed rail close to Palestinian population centers without offering direct access. This creates a two-tier mobility system where geographic proximity doesn't translate to connectivity. Critics call it infrastructure apartheid. Supporters argue the network serves existing Israeli population centers, not political agendas. Both perspectives shape public perception and influence funding decisions. There's also regional competition. Tel Aviv and Jerusalem vie for centrality in the network design. Each city wants to be the primary hub. Each believes its economic future depends on being better connected than the other. The result is route proposals that prioritize political optics over operational efficiency. Some connections make more sense symbolically than practically. Engineers find themselves designing networks that satisfy political coalitions rather than travel demand models. High-speed rail solves one problem remarkably well, long-distance travel between major cities. It doesn't solve everything. Local transit, last-mile connectivity, and urban congestion require different infrastructure. Israel is investing billions in trains that move people quickly between cities, while buses, trams, and metro systems inside those cities remain underfunded. The mismatch creates bottlenecks. A passenger can travel from Tel Aviv to Haifa in 30 minutes by high-speed rail, then spend 40 minutes stuck in local traffic trying to reach their actual destination. The train delivers them to the city. It doesn't deliver them home. This gap undermines the efficiency gains that justify high-speed investment in the first place. Urban planners argue the money spent on inner-city rail could build comprehensive metro systems in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Haifa that would benefit far more daily commuters. There's growing concern that high-speed rail concentrates economic activity in major cities, while smaller towns see no improvement. A farmer in the Negev doesn't benefit from faster Tel Aviv-Jerusalem service. A tech worker in Haifa does. Infrastructure becomes a tool for urban concentration rather than regional distribution. Some experts believe this accelerates inequality rather than reducing it. The trains move fast. The benefits don't spread evenly. Comment below if you think this will actually work. Autonomous Vehicles By the time Israel's full high-speed rail network becomes operational sometime in the late 2030s, self-driving cars could dominate the roads. The economic case for high-speed rail assumes current travel patterns persist. It assumes people continue choosing between personal cars and trains. But if autonomous vehicles offer door-to-door -door service at competitive prices while passengers work or sleep during the journey, Trains lose their primary advantage. This isn't science fiction, it's a timeline problem. Infrastructure projects take decades. Technology evolves faster. Israel committed to high-speed rail based on 25,000-talent-stalt-bauten-20s assumptions about mobility preferences. The 2040s might look completely different. Some transportation analysts warn that countries building expensive rail networks today are fighting yesterday's congestion problems with solutions that won't remain optimal. The counter-argument focuses on capacity. Highways have physical limits. Even with autonomous vehicles, roads can only move so many people per hour. High-speed rail can transport thousands of passengers simultaneously on a single track. As climate pressure increases, electric trains powered by renewable energy look more attractive than personal vehicles, autonomous or not. The debate isn't settled. 
Both futures seem plausible. Israel is betting billions that one vision wins. 20 years from now, Israel's high-speed rail network could be the backbone of a hyper-connected economy where distance becomes irrelevant and cities function as neighborhoods. But to me seem, commuters might live in Haifa, work in Tel Aviv, and have dinner in Jerusalem without spending more than an hour traveling. Or the system could become a cautionary tale about infrastructure that costs too much, serve too few, and arrive too late to matter. The real question isn't whether the trains will run fast. It's whether speed alone can reshape how millions of people choose to move through their lives. Every major rail project in history promised transformation. Some delivered, many didn't. Israel is small enough that success or failure will be obvious. There's nowhere to hide missed projections or empty trains. The tracks either redefine mobility or become monuments to optimism over analysis. Either way, the decision has been made, the tunnels are being dug, the contracts are signed, and a country smaller than New Jersey is betting it can build rail infrastructure that rivals systems in nations 10 times its size. The engineering is ambitious, the finances are uncertain, the outcome remains unwritten. If you want more stories about the technology shaping our future, subscribe to Next Blueprint, like the video, and share your thoughts in the comments.